So that's the first step. You have to start looking at the data. Start saying, how can I get quick successes, quick victories, etc. The next step is cost justify your solutions. So what are the key measures that you can look at other than absence costs? So what are some of the key performance indicators of your organization that people are talking about on a regular basis? Basically, what you want to do is speak the language of your management. right? If your management is looking at key performance indicators in lots of different areas other than health and safety, and you go into them, you, know, you go into the meetings or you are discussing trying to get buy-in from your management, and you're talking only about health and safety metrics, how successful will you be? Yeah, it's a challenge. I see a lot of laughs and smirks because you, you know, unless you're speaking their language, you're going to have challenges. So what's going to be the cost-benefit ratio, the payback period, equivalent revenues? How can you start talking again in their language so that you can create a message that's compelling to them, that gets them interested, and they look at it as a major business initiative? So that's step two. Then step three is start to integrate ergonomics up front. So rather than being responsive, we want to now take it to be proactive. So we want to look at how we can you know, not wait for absence to occur, not wait for injuries to occur, but how we can, this is where we're talking about risk management. How can we proactively collect information on risk and drive down risk so that we can document results? Collect data, take your data to design. So we talked about the interface, the work environment. So how can we take that data and say, hey, we're actually going to have a new um, building remodel. We're going to have some new workstations purchased. Why don't we actually look at those risk factors and act proactively rather than reactively when you're trying to manage tools that already been, have already been provided? And don't recreate the wheel. In incorporate ergonomics into existing systems. So think about the initiatives that have already been successful at your organization. What was it that was successful about them? And how can you incorporate ergonomics into those systems? So how can you, basically, I had a, a professor once tell me, you don't have to create the parade. You have to find the parade and see how you can get in front of it. And so that's essentially what you have to do is say, how can I integrate ergonomics into how we're already doing business? Because if people think it's something separate, it can be one, left behind, or two, it can be you know, put to the bottom of the priority list. And they say, oh yeah, I've got ergonomics on my, my to-do list, but it's at the bottom and only if I get time to do it. So how can you incorporate ergonomics into something that again, is already existing. And the final step, this is where you really start to then carry this momentum to another level. So sharing and advertising your successes and recognizing and acknowledging efforts. So how can you reward the managers that help support you? How can you reward the employees that had good ideas and that participated? How can you get them involved so that you create champions and you create really that climate that says, you know, ergonomics delivers results. And then what does it say at the bottom? Yeah, it's not a process that stops. That's why I don't use the word program because too often people think about ergonomics as a program and they lay out the steps and they lay out the major milestones and then once implementation is done, what happens? It stops, yeah. And it becomes that dusty binder on the shelf that says, oh yeah, there's our ergonomics policy. We implemented that two years ago. Well, what are you doing now? I don't know what we're doing now, but that, that training was good, or those classes were good. That was, that was all great stuff, but it stopped. So ergonomics has to be a process, and that's why it's so critical to implement it into some of your existing business systems. So we talked about what is ergonomics. We talked about the process approach to ergonomics. Now let's talk about ergonomics in the economy, because you're going to say, Rick, this sounds great. This sounds nice, having champions, driving results, working with management, protecting the health and safety of employees. This kind of sounds like utopia. But do you know what I have to go back to? Do you know what's waiting for me at my desk, waiting for me in my meetings? And it's news like this, right? Budget cuts, right? These kind of issues. Or is everyone here financially, you know, you guys are of abundance of resources? No? I'll take that as a no. Okay. So how can we then say, okay, well, in this tough economy, is ergonomics still important? Is ergonomics something that we can still justify? 
Well, here's some recent uh, statistics that I pulled off from the uh, National Health Service based in the UK. MSD's musculoskeletal disorders are the second biggest cause of work limiting health problems and sickness absence in the UK responsible for up to 10.8 million lost working days in 2008-2009. The cost of MSDs over 7 billion and uh, pers persistent pain and stiffness from MSDs uh, can cause a major impact on quality of life and result in more days off of work. So we know there's obviously significant impact to your organizations, right? This is health and safety data that we talked about. So what I challenge you to do is start thinking about, okay, we know that there's plenty of reason to show people that, hey, the concept of ergonomics makes sense. But my challenge to you is to be thinking about what I talked in the beginning. How can you relate this data to your managers, to your directors, to your executives? What is going to be the message? What's going to compel them? Is it going to be this data? Or is it going to be other data? You know, when they're looking at the newspaper that says this, are you going to be able to really drive momentum using this data? You might be able to open their eyes and get them interested here, but to really drive results, you're going to have to think about how you're going to create a message that focuses on them. So where is ergonomics going? If we were to look in the future, what are we going to be looking at when we talk about ergonomics? Well, these are some of the many disciplines that are involved in ergonomics. Medicine, biology, psychology, engineering, government relations and regulation. So all of these disciplines contribute to the discipline of ergonomics um, in a great way. But what you have to focus on is how do you combine these disciplines in a way where you have a balanced approach, right? If, again, when we focused on those three critical elements in the process of ergonomics, behavior, knowledge, and environment, if we came to ergonomics just using the discipline of engineering, we would affect the environment very well, right? But what might we miss? Knowledge. Knowledge. Behavior. Behavior, right? But if we came to it from a discipline of psychology, we might affect what really well? Behavior. Behavior, but we might miss out on the environment. So you can see that all of these disciplines play a significant role and have some importance, but it needs to be balanced. So that's where in your organization you have to think about how you can leverage these disciplines in a way to provide that balance. Now what are the occupations that are going to be involved in ergonomics moving forward? Well I created a uh, large list so large that it actually cut off the uh, page here <laughs> apparently. So look through this list real quick. Any surprises on here? Any occupations that you say, I really never considered that occupation when I thought about ergonomics? Any surprises? Lawyers. Lawyers, right? Yeah, how are lawyers involved in ergonomics? Claims. Yeah, claims, exactly. But they also might be from a, a legislative standpoint, right? Nutritionists. Yeah, nutritionists. What the heck does a nutritionist have to do with ergonomics? Well, think about it. What's that? Cumulative trauma, right. So these, is these issues, musculoskeletal disorders, are also referred to as cumulative trauma disorders. That's because they happen over time. You know, we're, we're never going to be able to eliminate all risk in the work environment. And so the good news is we have the ability to recover from what we call microtrauma. And this accumulation of microtrauma leads to an injury. So however, let's say you have the best work environments. So you've addressed the environment. You've addressed the knowledge of the workers and you address the behavior, well, let's say that they're eating you know, a diet that is not very healthy. Are they going to be more likely to recover from microtrauma? No. no. Yeah, so that's just one example of, you can see the diversity of occupations that are involved in ergonomics. And you can see how all of these can be leveraged. But it has to be something where you can think outside of the box, especially from your organization standpoint. Because remember, when you go back to the people, your people might be different than another organization's people. And so you have to start with looking at those people so that you can develop your process appropriately. So other trends looking to the future of ergonomics, um, significant use of autom automation, increased use of uh, computers and telecommunications, uh, increased number of uh, office, laboratory, and service jobs. So we're becoming much more of a service, knowledge-based workforce, right? What does, that have, what does that mean as far as the impact on ergonomics? Lots of movement, but not big movement. 
Right. Now you might think about musculoskeletal disorders. Why has there been a sudden rise as far as this, the statistics associated with musculoskeletal disorders? Right? Remember those things, the typewriter? I've never used one, but I've heard of them. I've seen pictures. <laughs> so why weren't people getting injured when they were using typewriters? Yeah, it's much more focused work now, right? I mean, you can s literally sit at a computer, let's say, for eight hours straight and do emails, data processing, research on the internet, right? You can um, instant message your colleague that sits right next to you, right? All of those things can be done in a focused, sedentary environment. With the, the typewriter, you know, you typed, and then you got to the end of the line. What'd you have to do for the old ones? The return, yeah. There's, okay, I got. I'm finished with the page, what do I have to do? Take the page out, put it here, get another page. So there was much larger movements. It created natural micro break. So ergonomics in a new economy, what is it going to look like? What are the impacts? Well, here's the new reality. People are going to be the engine of success. And we've been talking a lot about that when we looked at the ergonomics process. We looked about those factors. We put people in the middle. And we said, if you know about your people, if you think about your people from the start, you can affect those other factors in a much better way and drive results. So how many of you believe this? People are the engine for success. Go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, I got everyone to raise their hand. <laughs> All right, great. So if people are going to drive success, we have to think about what is the new currency. So, and what I mean is that if people aren't going to be the engine of success, you might think of the old economy, which was you know, capital, technology. Those things would be defined as assets, and those things would drive the success of the organization. But that's not the new reality, especially with a service and knowledge-based uh, environment. So if people are the drivers of success, the new currency is creativity, knowledge, relationship capital. So how creative do you think people will be if they have discomfort and pain? Less. <laughs> yeah, it's not a trick question. <laughs> what about knowledge? Do you think people will be able to learn better if they're in pain? No. no. What about relationships? Do people communicate really well when they're in pain? No, other than to their doctor to get out of pain, right? <laughs> so this is the new currency. And all of these things are affected by ergonomics. So this is where I start to challenge you again and say, think about the initiatives in your organization. You know, your organization might be coming to you and say, we need better ideas. We need more knowledge for our organization. We need better relationships with the communities, with the people that we serve. You know, all of these things. All of these things are affected by ergonomics. So this is where you can start to spin ergonomics and say, look, we can affect this new currency through ergonomics, and here's how. Workforce optimization. So continuing on with the new economy, you know, you look at capital, technology, brand, these are all things that organizations have optimized. There's plenty of optimization if you looked at your capital strategies, right? How your organizations have made your buildings more efficient, right? And how they've been able to, you know, cut costs there and optimize there. How you've been able to optimize your technology, right? New computers, servers, in some places, I'm sure. And your brand, you know, the brand message might not be as big as brand in the private sector, but still, you have a brand, right? Your organization has a message that they have to share with the community if, in order for you to be effective. And how that brand is managed is important. So all of these are things that your organization has optimized. What about your workforce? What about your workforce? And so if we are to start looking at workforce optimization, and how that affects the new economy and the new currency, we can look at a significant asset, which is your workforce, 60 to 70 percent of your operating costs. Now the challenge is most organizations look at this as strictly a cost. They say, well, that's the cost of doing business. Payroll and paying for our people is the cost of doing business. Do they look at it as an asset? Sometimes? How many of you have heard the uh, slogan, our employees are our greatest asset? Yeah? Is that something we practice? Something I'll do that maybe occasionally. 
you've argued it, right? But when they sit down with the financial metrics, you'll always see employees are in the cost sector, right? They're not manage, managing them like those other things that we just talked about, the technology, the brand, the capital. And so how can we say, look, the workforce is truly an asset. How can we optimize this workforce so that we can get better results? So here's the challenge that you have to start thinking about with your managers, changing their mindset. Workforce is not a cost, but it's going to be the primary source of growth and value. So looking at a case study, I just pulled this uh, off the internet this morning. This is from uh, 2009. It's a government agency in England, the British Library. So they looked at workforce optimization, mainly driven by health and safety perspectives. And here are some of the things that they were able to achieve. Uh, over a two-year period, absence dropped from 10.2 to 7.5 days. Um, cost of absence dropped 11%. Staff turnover was halved. So why do you think staff turnover was affected? Happy. happy, right? They're happy to go to work. They're comfortable at work. They probably have better relationships with their managers because their managers have been demonstrating that culture of caring that we talked about in the beginning. This one, I think, though, is if I were to tell you to focus on anything, performance management results that they saw uh, increased from 86% to 98%. So how many of your teams or your departments have missed deadlines? Over budget, right? Those kind of performance management issues, things that aren't implemented. So I'm going to leave you with this question because it's easy to sit through these presentations. We covered a lot of different information from uh, different areas. But if you leave today and you go back to your desk or your work environment and you don't apply anything, then I really haven't done my job today. So is ergonomics a strategic behavior for your organization? And when I mean strategic, it means will ergonomics be part of your overall success of your organization with the new economy, the new currency that we talked about? Will ergonomics be related to driving results? metrics, achievement. So is ergonomics a strategic behavior? Hopefully what I've done today is to give you the evidence to say it should be. And I just saw everyone nod, so I'm assuming that that's right. So if you're going to leave today saying ergonomics is, is or should be a strategic behavior, then your challenge is how are you going to make it a strategic behavior? And that's where organizations like Cardinus Risk Management can really help you. Um, and I'll be happy to share my presentation with you as well so you have all of those notes.